Hey, welcome back. Today we're talking about one of the, the puzzles, you know, for a lot of people, um, you know, sort of of your, of your painting viewing life, and that is what was Degas? You know, I remember when I was a student, what, what was Degas? Was he an Impressionist or not? Um, Genius 2 asks, would you describe Degas as an Impressionist? I think he saw his work as something different. I don't disagree with uh, Genius 2. <laughs> I remember as a young student, uh, oh, I'm sorry, way before I was ever a student of painting in the official sense, I remember looking at Impressionist, books on Impressionism. I remember seeing Renoir and Monet and all those other guys, and they all looked the same. When you got to Degas, that did not feel like the same thing. I had no idea what to do with it. So this is, this is dedicated to the question, well, <laughs> what eventually happens? Is Degas an Impressionist? So let's start with an interesting qu another question, and that is, what in the heck is an Impressionist? It's the most important thing you can do if you're going to try to... I love that about C.S. Lewis. He would tell us to find terms first. Um, what is an Impressionist? So you know the word was first used with Monet. The, you know, Gamma would say the Impressionist with a capital I. And uh, so those guys were the, the Impressionists as they were titled by some critic or something or other. And they took that word uh, for their own. I don't think they used it for themselves, but maybe they did. But they took it for their own and had shows of Impressionists, and Degas showed with them, so there he was, looking like an Impressionist. Um, it's interesting that he referred to him once as an Impressionist. He says, I'm an Impressionist in line. And I think I can tell you what that might m suggest, and we'll, we'll deal with that. But an Impressionist, uh, the, way, the way it really has to be seen, is in contradistinction distinction from somebody who creates pictures constructs pictures, creates pictures. So an illustrator, by definition, is not an Impressionist. His, 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 his look may be Impressionistic once you, once you buy into Monet and, and that group of people as being Impressionists. Um, it's harder for some people to understand uh, Velasquez and calling Velasquez an Impressionist because Velasquez isn't using broken color and all that sort of thing, so how can we go all the way back and call him an Impressionist? Well, Gamble would use a small I and say Impressionist, meaning he was painting nature as he sees it and trying to just draw the beauties of it out of the look of nature and not constructing. Although the, the, the two pictures that are most famous for being, for being uh, uh, his, his, his venture into that area, the Las Alondras and Las Meninas, those pictures uh, are at least partially, judging said by the dog in Las Meninas, are, are, are certainly pieced together. And in fact, they certainly are in any case. You're not, you know, the work would be different, at least in the Las Meninas, if he hasn't, hadn't been doing aspects of it piecemeal. Now, just because you're doing it piecemeal doesn't mean you're not an Impressionist, by the way. And that's important to say. Uh, your method and all that sort of thing. Uh, it's just that there was an evolution of method. And when you're talking about Monet, you're talking about sort of the original method, which is like pointillism, like spot, you know, Surat. You know, it's like trying to get um, uh, the field of color and values and all that sort of stuff and get it to produce that, the grand sense of the appearances of things at the expense of all else. I think of Monet rather as a research project, you know, um, ultimately. And... Uh, and now, you, obviously, you're, everybody is in your own discovery of painting and sorting out uh, how to handle nature. All that stuff is kind of a research project, research into truth in various ways. And um, so there's that, and that's his methodology. It was this pointless sort of thing, broken color, and it's coming into drawing later, more slowly. Uh, the Dutch before him, John Kind and, and uh, whatever, um, um, I shouldn't say whatever, <laughs> Boudin. Uh, both had were, were sort of mark makers, somewhat a little more like some of what Manet does, um, uh, in and and didn't 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 come out of that thing of of sort of waiting for drawing. They would do things that suggested drawing earlier, and so did earlier Monets look like that. But I don't want to get into that the whole methodology. I'm simply saying that if 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 impressionism, painting a scene in front of you is one thing, and drawing forth the music that you that that your visual music from the scene in front of you is impressionism by definition, then the other thing, constructing pictures uh, that you have in your head, isn't right, and so that's sort of the that's sort of the two models, the way we think of it. They're constructed pictures. Now, they're by the way, their pictures divide up in different ways. There are different reasons for classifying in different ways, but that's one of the most striking ones. When you start asking about impressionists, you've got about ask about what an impressionist isn't. So. Um, it's just a useful division, but for our purposes, let's leave it at that because we know what Monet was. 
And we know, and now we're going to look at what Degas was. Uh, and by the way, this is an interesting quote. To, speaking to the Impressionists as a group, he told them, I forget who's being quoted here from, from France back in the day. Uh, speaking to the Impressionists as a group, he told them that what they required was natural life, whereas he needed artificial life. And uh, so that fits really perfectly in his whole idea that, 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 that uh, painting is artifice with the accent of truth. Their idea is drawing forth the truth, drawing forth the music right out of the truth in front of you. Uh, so it's, it's got a different sort of motive, a different, a different angle on truth and a different, uh, uh, um, yeah, a different, um, I don't know if the end goal is much different in one sense. It isn't, but, but in, in one sense it is, though. If your entire musical ensemble is already seen in front of you, your job is to find out what's making that sing like that and actually get it onto canvas so people can see it. That is definitely a different thing from, from having a story and putting it together effectively and then getting the colors and things to relate in a very beautiful, well-organized composition. Uh, so, but that second part is artificial. That's what Degas was saying. That's, that's artificial. That's pieced together uh, where they wanted the scene. So uh, let's look at pictures. Degas' first uh, teacher uh, was, hey, why is my picture not coming up? There we go. Uh, my, the guy's first teacher was not Louis Lamote. It was his second teacher. That's wrong. That should say Barias or Barius. And uh, up in the top there, um, Gamble points out in the uh, shop talk of Edgar Degas, which, by the way, if, you're, if you haven't read it, is the most important book on Degas that you can read. It was written by a painter, and a painter who, who was actually alive, I believe, before. Was he alive before Degas died? I think he was, actually. Not that that means a ton. But he was within a sort of a half generation of his existence and knew the conversation around Degas from other painters. Uh, and all, and, but, but, but the book is all uh, primarily based on what other painters said about, about Degas, painters like Jean Yacht and others. What they're saying about Degas, what they, the quotes and the quotes that they have for you, Degas said. And that's what gives that unique value to that book. So please, whenever you get a chance, and if you don't have access to it, ask me for it, okay? Um, all right, so uh, so Lamotte was his first teacher. You can see he's painting pictures, imaginative pictures, so the constructed pictures, and he's having to put together drawings. These aren't for those pictures. And then those drawings then turn into some sort of a preliminary study, and then they get worked up, you know, traced onto the canvas or whatever, and all noodled up one figure at a time, trying to maintain a plausible unity. Uh, uh, this is painting I found. There's not many yet to be found, but this, guy, this painting is interesting to me because it does remind me just a little bit of Degas, and I'm not going to tell you. I think I know why, but he wasn't with Degas very long, uh, with Barrius very long. Degas wasn't. Most of his career was with, uh, with this guy, Louis Lamotte, who was a teach student of Ang's, student of Ang's along with um, Flandrin and uh, Cesario and who else? Um, a couple of Flandrin brothers, actually. But um, uh, Gamble likes to give this guy credit for being a greater talent, a uh, greater mind in painting, uh, Louis Lamotte. In any case, Degas, student of Louis Lamotte. Uh, by the way, other students of Louis Lamotte include Henry Regnault and some really strong, some really strong performers, and Tissot um, and some others that would, it's just worth, you know, if you can find your trail there, uh, it's worth looking at. But um, here you see that uh, the, the direct lineage in a sense in terms of what kind of picture. So here's a painting, self-portrait by Ang. The drawing is done. He, he paints the, and he paints, traces it and paints the thing in color. Probably does a preliminary color study, uh, certainly for a lot of work he does. And uh, same thing here. Here's uh, Louis Lamotte doing a drawing, which he then presumably trace, et cetera, et cetera. Here are the preliminary drawings for the Degas. So you can see they're all, you know, Louis seems to be following his master and Degas following maybe the both of them. Degas has nothing but good things to say about Ang. But you can see that Ang's early training was in the direction of, of shall we say, an imaginative approach, which is do drawings and, and, and make the painting from the drawings. Well, you may as well call it indirect, but you can also call it, what, as I've said before, constructed. And this is plausibly a Louis, I mean, a, yeah, Louis Lamotte. Uh, this is from St. Clotilde. And uh, Flandrin had a lot of work with uh, this church, uh, but a number of French painters did. Um, you know, it was an amazing thing. The, uh, 
the willingness of these churches or the desire of these churches to power them up with, with beautiful paintings in France. Just amazing, uh, amazing. And, um, but these are, as you can see, storytelling pictures. Uh, you could say illustrations probably of something either in scripture or in, um, or in church history or something like that. And uh, so these would all be pieced together from drawings and that's exactly the background uh, that Degas comes out of. And he spends a, spends a bunch of years there, okay? Uh, now in the meantime, of course, Monet is evolving, but uh, Degas is starting up his career looking like them. He does lots of drawings and puts together the pictures, just like those guys are doing. For, uh, in our next slide, you can see that the two figures for the rape of the Sabine women are here, and then the upper uh, one of, I don't know, some... some uh, I want to tell you that I know what... Uh, maybe that's French. I can't remember what nationality that is. It's another story. It's, it not, I don't think it's mythology. I think it's actually history. But you can see that the um, figures, here's the, the, the sort of crouched figure and the horse. And over here, there's the drawing, and here's the other drawing by Degas for this painting. These drawings, by the way, uh, are as beautiful as drawing gets in Western art. Uh, but when Degas refers to himself, and I, so in other words, I'm telling you, he's one of the great draftsmen of all time. And from the point of view of the truth of the look of nature, he might be the greatest. I mean, that's, that's, that's how seriously good this guy is. Um, now, what you're seeing, though, um, is when he calls himself an impressionist in line, I'm going to suggest to you just one possibility, and that is he's painting exactly, he's drawing exactly what he sees and not using any constructs. He's not making a figure eight heads when it isn't eight heads. So he doesn't have these conventions of the day going on. There's sometimes you look at Nang and you can see the hands are handled in a peculiar way that looks like a, he was trained to make hands like this, you know. And his treatment of, of, of joints and things like that is very Davidian, you know, so much that it looks borrowed. It doesn't mean he's not a great draftsman. That's not what I'm saying even a little bit. But, uh, but when you call yourself an impressionist, these things feel like, I mean, you can imagine a figure lying there and actually having exactly those forms. And he pushes them enough, even in terms of their light, for the, uh, for the sense of, uh, you know, with, for, with a very clear sense of almost doing a cast drawing <laughs> as precisely as you can. But it's so, when I say, he's, he, I, when I, he refers to himself as an impressionist, that's what I think, that he's painting more truthfully exactly what he sees. And uh, so if he's an impressionist in line, I think what he's saying is when he is drawing, he's drawing exactly what he sees. That's, that's what I take it doesn't mean that's definitive by any means. By the way, I'm no historian with these things. You remember, everything I'm doing is because of what I see. I'm reacting visually. I have my experience. I have my, my experience before nature. And by the way, if you really want to understand painters, have a deep experience with, with your, understand nature. Be able to paint what you see in front of you with, some, with authority. And you can be a start, be, you'll start understanding painters a great deal better. And, and I mean to say, then you can start taking the lessons, in my view. Very interesting problem. Um, Interesting story. And Degas himself, by the way, is always t talking this way, sort of trashing nature. In the meantime, he was the greatest student of nature you can imagine. It's funny, he was laughing at Manet, and he says, Manet sa is saying something about everything that he does being original and, and, and meaning, meaning from life in, in some way or another. You know? And Degas says he, he borrows more from, from, the, from, the, uh, from, from uh, his ancestors in painting than anybody I know. Well, Degas is the same way. You know, Degas is borrowing more truth than anybody I know, even while he's constructing pictures. So, so these are more preliminary drawings, as you see the type that would be done for, for pictures. These, the Spartan um, youth painting has, if I can find my uh, laser thing again, there we go. But you can see that he had a different background at one point. He puts the mountain over here at some point and does other things, various changes. Uh, and, uh, but you can see that he's got these, this group of figures here. And he, these two appear to be significantly the same. This one seems to step forward and stand in this location, as you can see down here. And then there's a different figure entirely right, right there. But you can see this whole thing is about moving stuff around. And this is constructing your design. And this is classic old design of figure grouping, you know, just quality figure grouping, evolving a great pattern, a great uh, uh, interplay of, of parts, good old school, um, you might say patterning 101. That's who this guy is. He's, you know, this isn't impressionism. And he's doing this while Monet is out there on the beach painting, hitting notes. 
so, and so I'm just showing you a couple more. This is the cafe scene. You can see this has a non-visual a thing to it, right? It looks like a flat picture. It looks like um, almost something like a watercolor or something. It's got to get a certain absolute falseness to it. <laughs> Keep remembering that Degas said, I, it's, a, it's all artifice with the accent of truth. And <laughs> he definitely gets the accent of truth. And he does it by, shall we say, by other means than impressionistic ones. Even though his color range, by the way, seems to be uh, stepping up a bit. A lot of people's were once they saw Monet wake the world up. So here's another one where you can see the preliminary drawing for the figure of the, um, of the master class, uh, the, the, the master of the dance class, or the dance rehearsal. I forget what this was titled. But, and then here's a, another study, which may be a pastel. I'm not sure it is. I'm not going to dig my face into that. But you can see a preliminary study. All this stuff is typical of the guys who are piecing together pictures. The background of this picture actually, uh, while it's sort of impressionist in its blobs, looks like it might have been uh, actually drawn in by perhaps somebody like uh, the um, architectural draftsman that, um, you know, what do you call it, a perspectivist that was used by uh, Jerome. It looks like it could have been the same guy, the, the careful attention to the, to the particulars of the, of the, uh, of the architecture. So let's look at, uh, for a second, um, we're talking about the um, uh, idea of what impression is. The, everybody's looking for unity. So if you want to look at this for a second, I found this recently, and I just threw it on here, but it's not, it's not completely uh, apropos, but listen to it in any case. He's talking about Velasquez. He says, in this case, of course, one means by nature the man's impression of the color effect of the whole field about to be painted. So that idea, the, the color impression of the, you know, Man's impression of the color effect of the whole field taken together. That's, 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 that, that's what impressionism is, right? And so when you get a guy like Degas, he's trying to get that quality or suggest that quality. So I take the trouble, and, and by the way, in virtue of this impressionistic way of seeing, now I, I suggest that impressionistic, I managed to get myself a nice tick. That's a good thing. I got lots of good lessons for us today. <laughs> <laughs> well, this life is good in New England. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, Mr. Producer. A little levity is always good, right? Uh, nevertheless, what I'm going <laughs> to... So what we're talking about, this key difference right here is between Impressionism and Impressionistic, right? And Degas continually is Impressionistic. He borrows stuff from the Impressionists, looks like Monet a whole bunch of the time, and yet doesn't. So he's borrowing a look borrowing ideas, broken color, things like that, all kinds of things. But I'm going to suggest to you that there are two different things out there. One is Impressionism, and one, 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 what, that's a literally painting the visual impression in front of you, and the other one is making that appear to be doing that. And that's a, that's a development, if you want to call it that, uh, when you see the grand, marvelous harmonies of a, uh, of, a, of, a, of a Monet when he really has got it going on. You can see how that would have been something that these other painters like Degas, who are painting imaginatively, want to, want to incorporate. Into their, into their imaginative constructs. So um, just have that in mind. You can read the rest of this you know, later on. Um, but you understand the difference between the uh, idea of what a painter like him is doing, creating a beautiful decorative impression versus a realistic uh, thing. Uh, I mean, painting it from life directly. And he, as I said to you before, I think I haven't told you this today, but you know that he just said that plein air painters ought to be shot. If, you, if I had, if I was a landowner, had in my field, I'd be out there with a shotgun. Um, and, and he warns people not to paint from life, just paint from the masters and all that sort of stuff. But as I said before, he's not that guy. He everything. Look at the, look at the drawings for these horses. This is absolutely from life. You know what I mean? Now he would say from life. He would separate the idea from life from the idea of of, of a uh, memory uh, study. Uh, these look to be actually directly from life, but he had this enormous memory, uh, and he's using. So we know that he did memory uh, memory landscapes. They're worth your time to look at, and we and you should read everything Degas says about memory. It's a fascinating thing, and Degas actually believed, have, possibly having heard some of this stuff, that if he could have developed his own memory uh, better earlier, he would have been a significantly better painter, a better draftsman. I think maybe is what Degas, uh, what uh, Gamel says. But as you can say, this is that classic model. This is impressionistic. This is impressionism, right? He did not paint this from life. He pieced it all together. Now, in that way, I, you can see why I might have said what I did a couple videos ago about Soroya, because Soroya really does look like he's putting drawings. He's getting drawings out there on the panel, and then he's painting this big scene as if it were an impression. And all the things that can be out there in front of you, the water, the land, all this sort of stuff, the sky, these things are all being painted in a relational way. 
Um, and in Degas' case, not sort of being, well, he's sitting there, but his, from his memory. So he's, his memory is a relational memory. So he's got this incredible plausibility to his truth here, as much as plausible as this, uh, some of the same kinds of notes as this Monet. But as you can see, what he's doing is he's evolving this thing, and his unity is coming from a decorative, for decorative purposes. So the, the greens here and the interplay of greens throughout the entire field, or the pinks, and the pink, the pink inter, the interplay of pinks, and that whole field of pinks and the field of pinks. You see the pinks? This is decorative painting now. And he referred to himself as a decorator, so keep that in mind at all times. Um, I'll be in a second. I'll give you this quote where, where, where uh, Stevenson again refers to these three different kinds of painting. Let me come upon that in a second. Uh, but you can see that what he's doing here, you don't, you don't find the horses in the field designing their legs great, right? So that's all got to be done artificially. Artificial, right? He said it's all artifice with the accent of truth. And so this, you know, this is studied nature in front of you. Uh, if you're like a Boston School painter, you're trying to make it more true and more true every second, make it as like as you can, and then make it more like Bonat sort of rule. But your idea is to draw forth the beauty from the truth of what you see in front of you and really draw it, really draw it forth by this pursuit of, of, of what is it about nature? What is it about the relationships that are making this thing happen? And can I get them? Can I get them till that, till that magic happens that I see out there? And of course, then you have to figure out how to stop painting. So you don't know, suddenly turn it into a field of simple photographic realism, even in color, which so quickly happens uh, if you have too much of a, so we say a conscience, uh, about what a real painting is. You know, what, how do you define real paintings and realism and all that sort of stuff? Uh, let's look at that. Um, well, let's look at the last to go first. Uh, just another example of a, potentially this drawing for this section of this painting. Again, remember that Degas is this guy who's madly in love with, with design at this point, right? And I just, all you have to do is look at this. I'm going to call this the sticks of the legs here and the interplay, the run of this, the, just the sheer pleasure of the run of these elements, uh, you know, from vertical to non-vertical, this play of angles as in the tutu stuff, all this stuff, all these grand abstractions. The pure abstractions of painting playing together. That's who Degas was. And he just happens to be owning into, buying into um, uh, some of the um, uh, uh, methodology, some of the, some of the products, I think I'd better say, uh, of uh, painting, doing it with those things. I do want to say this, um, uh, show us one picture here. I mentioned this thing before, but Valerie, Paul Valerie, who's that poet who, who, who talks about um, Degas uh, says that it's funny that he didn't paint, shall we say, this way. He was referring to what Sargent and everybody else was doing. And he says, it's amazing he didn't paint this way because he knew about it. It was all in the air around him. He couldn't possibly have missed it. And yet here you can see an example of a guy who's painting what I'd call effectively, effectively this is Impressionism. And I would call it even visual order Impressionism. As you can see, the visual order of the edges, these effects, talking to these effects, all being absolutely rightly related to each other, purely in a purely visually ordered abstraction with effectively coming out of a lost and found mindset. So it's not that he didn't do it, it's just that he, uh, he, he typically didn't. He, he would do an object and draw the outlines of other parts of the objects, everything outline-based. He seemed to get greater pleasure out of that. Even the, the sort of the funny drawing of the background, which doesn't look false, it does, but an Impressionist wouldn't have rendered it, wouldn't look like that to an Impressionist. Um, you can see there's something else going on where the drawing is leading, but not impressionist drawing. It's um, it's academic drawing of objects, just all the outline of things and so on. I'm just mentioning that, but it, so this, this at this moment here, he's sort of a Boston School impressionist, but that's not who he was as a painter. So what was he? This scene, you could say this is a this is a realistic scene, you know, in the sense of a scene from life. It's a real story and all that sort of stuff. But this gets closer to what I call realism than it is to impressionism, right? The idea of the impressionist, of course, again being to to find the music of the scene in front of you through the color value and all the interplay of those things. Well, this isn't doing that. He's rather chosen colors, and he doesn't doesn't mean that he doesn't do well with it. But you can see that when he goes to the next level, uh, like these, it's pure music what he's doing with color. And this is what you might as well call the lesson of impressionism. You know, the, the amount of music that's available to you there in that spot in that moment. Uh, which is why I showed you the uh, picture earlier. Let me go back for a second to this statement from Stevenson, and I'll go back to, the, to some other pictures. This is what Stevenson says, in all kinds of really artistic work, whether decorative, realistic, or impressionist, and that's the key words, is those three right there. In all kinds of really artistic work, one sees evidence of, the, of that liking for unity of some kind, which pervades every art and painting, 
it may, it, which pervades every art. In painting, it may appear in line, chiaroscuro, color, or in a combination of all the qualities. Well, it's funny the way he says that, but yeah, that's the very definition of it. If you don't have unity, you're not, you don't last very long sort of in the field of other painters. But what he says here that I think is great and most interesting and valuable is this idea of the decorative versus the realistic versus the impressionist. He makes, he differentiates those three. So, um, and so we have this idea of painting from life, the scene in front of you, trying to draw forth the visual, the purely appearance-based magic. We have the realistic, usually uh, much more interested in the subject, the story, and, um, and getting it to feel real in the object sense of the word. And then we have a decorative one, which does all sorts of other things that are, not, that are, that are forgiven for not being any, either of the others. It just happens that Degas called himself a decorator. And uh, so what that sets you up to do is take a certain amount of liberties with both anything, uh, you know. But, he's, but I don't find Degas to be either an Impressionist or a realist uh, at all, except that at times, uh, through the middle of his career, because of his whole background, he was a realist, yeah. But he says he's a decorator, so let's leave him at that. In the meantime, let's go back and just look at these for a second, because this is a slice-of-life painting, really interestingly unified in the sense of what you would see if you just looked at this at this big impression. So he undoubtedly stood there, had this room in front of him, and was organizing the values and all that sort of thing. And then people were in spaces in different places of this room, and he was painting the visual impression, the order of the effects of light and all that sort of stuff that is purely visual. He does this thing that really wakes the world up. Degas is not doing that. Degas is borrowing some of this knowledge, but Degas... The guy gets a sense, a marvelous sense of unity, but you can see it's a decorative unity. And uh, for example, all the hands playing, interplaying together, that's decorative unity. The colors, the color play between the golds, the oranges, the greens, whatever else, you know, and the play of form, of shape, and all those things. His unity is um, coloristic unity, for example. It's value distribution unity. It's all those things. But it, this is what gives you this moment when you realize who Degas is. Degas is the first guy that actually says, it's not realism, and I don't believe in Impressionism because it doesn't do this, but I like some of the things that both of them deliver. So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to actually come to the terms with what painting really is. Painting is beauty of the, of the seen world, and I'm going to just drop everything except deliver you music. I'm going to make music out of it. I'm going to find you the music in every possible way. And this is where being a master of line, being a master of form, being a master of color relations, uh, even being skillful with broken color, all these things can be huge, huge helpers in terms of this hunt for the pure beauty. And I don't know of any other way to describe his stuff than that. You know, rather I'd call pure beauty. It's a funny thing to say, but Impressionism, that getting the magic, the, the power, the beauty of the thing in front of you, it's still beauty, no question about it. But this guy's up, Degas is abstracting it. He's to actually say, look, let's just think about this on his own terms. Let's just say, let's, if I had this green here, what, what pink would I put with it? And what's, what's he looking for? So he's an imaginative painter. Even in the, on these terms, he's looking for, the, for a set of imagined relationships. He finds them in rugs somewhere, as he says, carpets, uh, things like that. But, yeah, I don't know if that's a good, good place to end, but uh, I'm just suggesting to you my sense of him. And believe me, everything I've said is just based on what I see. Uh, I'm not interested in reading books of what anybody else says of this or that school or 10 other things <laughs> or whatever else. I'm just like, don't you look at him, don't you see? But you do have to come up to, to come to terms with impression, with the idea of what an impressionist is, at least this way historically, to your, to your own eyes, you can see that's what. And if you paint it this way, you know what we're doing. And you, 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 once you know, once you're a decent impressionist, you can see both sides. You can see the realist over here, and you can see the decorator over here, and you can see what the difference actually is in those little worlds. I'm going to leave you on that note. Um, th uh, interesting question. Thank you for that question, uh, uh, Genius 2. And uh, I know I'm still due to do one for you, uh, Jocko, on uh, the 15 things you have to know. <laughs> that was a random number, by the way, but it's not a particularly bigger number than that. Uh, and I've made a couple lists for you. I did, never thought to do this definitively, and uh, I could have done it on spur of the moment, but, I, but I'll get to that. Now, I do want to thank those donors, and um, I want to uh, thank you all for who came and enjoyed the uh, live thing together just last week. Uh, I look forward to doing it again and again. Um, all right, so that's it. Enjoy Degas no matter what. Enjoy him. Get the lesson of Degas. Don't try to fit him into this and say he's weak at that. Let, it, let yourself see him for what he is. All right? Great. See you next time.